Here we are, chapter 10, muscle-driven simulations. This is a whole new topic, really fascinating, an area that I've worked on for almost 30 years, believe it or not. And here's the outline that I'll use for talking about muscle-driven simulations. First, we'll talk about why even simulate movement? What is a muscle-driven simulation? How to test a muscle-driven simulation? And finally, the fourth section is about OpenSim, a powerful tool for creating muscle-driven simulations. So let me start with why do we simulate movement? We've just spent several chapters and many hours learning how to measure the various features of motion with experimental data. Isn't that enough to fully understand human movement? It's not. Experimental data alone is insufficient for understanding muscle actions during movement, really for two reasons. First, important quantities like the forces generated by muscles just can't be measured in experiments. Second, it's difficult to establish cause-effect relationships through experimental observations alone. For example, I may be analyzing someone during walking and I see that they, I measure EMG signals and I can see when the muscle's on and even that it's on strongly, but I don't know what the action of that muscle is during the body. So in addition to experiments, we need a theoretical framework to advance our understanding of muscle function during movement. This framework must reveal the relationships between muscle activations, muscle forces, ground reaction forces, and the motions of the body. And muscle-driven simulations offer this framework. Let me show you what I mean. So here's a simulation in which we can, it's a muscle-driven simulation. Now we can turn off all the muscles. We turn on just the vasti muscle. That's one of the quadriceps. And you see naturally it extends the knee. That's what we expect. It crosses in front of the knee and it extends the knee. But what you also notice is that it also moves the other joints. For example, look up at the pelvis. The pelvis is changing its dimension. You look down at the ankle, the ankle's moving as well. All of these degrees of freedom are affected by the muscle, even though it crosses only the knee. Let's take another example. Here, we're looking at the soleus muscle. It crosses only the ankle. Now in this simulation, I just turned the soleus off. So the ankle flexes more than it should be. You also see that the knee is flexing as well. So even though the muscle crosses only the ankle, it affects the knee and the hip as well. How does that occur? Why is the muscle action so complex? Well, dynamic coupling makes interpretation of muscle actions quite complex. Dynamic coupling describes the phenomenon whereby the motion of one body segment affects the motion of another body segment due to induced forces. So as I'm showing here, the forces generated by the soleus not only generate an ankle plantar flexion moment, but it also induces intersegmental forces and joint accelerations throughout the body. The magnitudes and directions of these intersegmental forces depend on the force applied to the muscle, the muscle's moment arm, the mass and inertial properties of the body segments, and the pose of the body. So in the example that I'm showing on the right-hand side, the force generated by the soleus produces a, a counterclockwise acceleration of the shank. That's what we expect. Now that requires the knee joint to accelerate upward and to the left. And the inertia of the thigh and the adjoining segments resists that acceleration. And that results in intersegmental results, uh, forces in the, in the knee, which in turn accelerates the thigh and so on. So the soleus, even though it only crosses the ankle, accelerates all of the joints. And we have to take into account dynamic coupling to correctly assess the actions of muscles during movement. So computer simulations complement experimental analyses of movement 
and give information that's not available in the experiments. So it's valuable for a number of reasons. For example, it's valuable to visualize your experimental data, such as the joint angles, ground reaction forces, and EMG patterns to help see the relationships and to find errors. Now, I don't want to pass this by too quickly. When I started making visualizations of biomechanical data, I animated data from a, a really excellent paper. But when I looked at the visualizations, there were obvious errors that couldn't be detected. The foot would go through the floor, our bones would go through each other. So if you're doing even experiments, you should anim animate those results and visualize your results. So visualizing helps you see complex movement patterns. Second, dynamic simulations complement experimental approaches by providing measures of variables such as the muscle forces, the joint forces, the muscle tendon lengths, which are difficult or impossible to measure experimentally. So if you're wondering how a novel walking pattern affects knee loads, for example, you can't measure those without putting a prosthesis into a joint. And that's been done only a few times in human history. But you can use a simulation to compute it. Thirdly, simulations enable cause-effect relationships to be identified. Remember I said that we couldn't tell if I get EMG in one muscle what it's doing to the rest of the body? So if I'm trying to diagnose a movement disorder and I see abnormal EMG activity and I don't know what motions that causes, if I have a simulation of that movement, it lets me establish cause-effect relationships. And that is super important. If you're doing science and you can't establish cause and effect, you're kind of lost. But simulations help you do that. And finally, Simulations allow you to do design studies, for example. If I want to design an exoskeleton that reduces the metabolic cost of motion, I can do that in simulation. Or if I want to design a walking pattern that relieves joint pain, you can also do that in a simulation. So you see, simulations complement experimental analyses and are, are quite powerful. So I'll organize the uh, presentation around uh, this specific set of uh, examples, we talked about why to simulate movement. I now want to move on to uh, what is a muscle-driven simulation. So, nicely, a muscle-driven simulation looks a lot like the whole organization of this course. We, of course, begin with neural command here. That neural command excites muscles. They generate forces. Those forces act on the skeleton. Through skeletal dynamics, uh, it produces accelerations, and over time, those accelerations are integrated to produce changes in body position. In a muscle-driven simulation, we represent all of these features, and the key problem is computing what those muscle excitations are. Now, to create a muscle-driven simulation, we need a model of the musculoskeletal system. And in some cases, we'll use a planar model so it's a two-dimensional model. And what I'm showing here is a, a simple planar model of the, the arm, the upper extremity, and a planar model with just a few muscles of the lower extremity. And we frequently use these when we're analyzing a problem that only requires a simple model. The simplest model that can give you the insight you need is the kind of model that you want to use. But in some instances, you need a more complex model. So what I'm showing here is a three-dimensional model of the neck that's been used to study injury mechanics. For example, when a soccer ball hits the head, we can analyze the contributions of muscles and ligaments to the motions of the vertebral segments. And here's a three-dimensional model of the upper extremity that was used to design surgeries to restore reaching and grasp after various um, injuries that might have paralyzed certain muscles. And in those cases, these more complicated three-dimensional models are really quite appropriate. Now, the crux of creating a muscle-driven simulation is this. That is, finding the pattern of excitations that produce a coordinated movement. You can imagine that's very challenging. What we're trying to do is figure out how the brain and spinal cord work together to coordinate the many muscles we have to create a, a nice orchestrated movement. And Computationally, you can think of trying to solve this problem. So what I'm plotting here is excitation here versus time. 
So for every muscle, we want to know what the excitation of the muscle is at every point in time. So let's say we have just one muscle. It's a very simple model, a very simple simulation. What we do is we'll use optimization to adjust the excitation patterns to see if it produces a coordinated movement. And that's quite a challenging computational problem that we'll get into later, but that is the crux of creating a muscle-driven simulation. Once we have that coordinated pattern of excitations, we can produce a well-orchestrated motion. So, and it's very powerful. So here's just a, a set of frames from a muscle-driven simulation of walking. And what you can see from that is the red muscles are ones that are excited, the blue muscles are relaxed, and we can see the timing and pattern of excitation. And you can see that in your textbook, and I provide plots along with that. But in addition to just visualizing the results, you can go deeper. We can analyze what the force is in every one of these muscles. We can compute what the fiber lengths are, what the stretch of tendon is, what the energy stored in tendon is during running, for example, what the forces are in each joint. So we get a much more detailed look into the under the hood aspects of biomechanics of movement. So it's an extremely powerful technique. So we've talked a little bit about why to simulate movement, what is a muscle-driven simulation. Because it's a simulation, a key component is how we test it to see if it really represents reality. And that's the plan for the next step.